Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome to today's discourse under the aegis of Vasant Rao Dempo Diamond Jubilee Lecture Series, where ideas converge. We are indeed fortunate to be able to witness this intellectual treat, a lecture from Padma Shri T.V. Mohandas Pai, a persona renowned for his financial and business acumen and the magnitude of his philanthropy. BCT's Dempe College of Arts and Science welcomes you, sir, and are humbled at your graciousness for accepting our invitation. Also joining us today is the president of this function, chairman of the Dempo Group of Companies and Dempo Charities Trust, Sri Srinivas Dempo, administrator of DCT Educational Institutions, Sri Rajesh Batikar, principal of DCT's Dempe College of Arts and Science, Professor Vrinda Borkar, and Vice Principal Srimati Manjari Barve. A warm welcome to the other dignitaries joining us on this platform. The Dempe legacy has been one of transformation, keeping abreast of changes that impact the world at large. As we celebrate our six decade long journey, we would like this process to continue to permeate the lives and trajectories of all our stakeholders, the most important of whom are our beloved students. Today's lecture, titled Succeeding in the Digital World, comes at a time when online transactions have been the order of the day in every sphere. Succeeding in times governed by the digital becomes paramount and our chief guest, his words of wisdom would serve all, especially the current generation wishing to make an impact in the world. As an institution, we too aim to achieve excellence in the digital arena. The principal of DCT's Tempe College of Arts and Science will now welcome and address the audience. Ma'am. Good evening, all. It is my pleasure to welcome you all virtually for the second lecture of Vasantrao Dempo Diamond Jubilee Lecture Series on Succeeding in Digital World. It is my proud privilege to welcome today's esteemed speaker, Padma Shri TV Mohandas Pai, Chairman Areen Capital Partners, former CFO and member of Gold Infosys Limited. I also welcome the chairman of Dempo Charities Trust and Dempo Group of Companies, Sri Srinivas Dempo. Also, administrator, Sri Rajesh Bhatikar, principals of other institutions, faculty from various colleges, all the dignitaries who are with us online, our former VC, Dr. Professor Varun Sahani, students who have joined us for this webinar, a warm welcome to all of you. Dempe College of Arts and Science began its illustrious journey in June 1962, within six months of Goa's liberation from Portuguese rule. It is premier institute of higher learning in the state of Goa. Over the last six decades, the education sector in India has undergone a dramatic change. In realization of the critical role that education plays in the development of human resource for scientific, technological, and economic advancement of nation, the focus has shifted from gross enrollment to the dimensions of quality in education, which broadly encompasses the quality of infrastructure, learning resources, quality of teaching learning processes, and sustained focus on learning outcomes. Thus, the college has added new disciplines, subjects, skill development courses, developed infrastructure and instrumentation, and conducted workshops, seminars, and hands-on training, keeping abreast of the need of the hour and counteracting the challenges posed due to globalization. The college earned A grade from NAC, college with potential for excellence 
from UGC, ISO 9001-2015 certification, green certification, NIRF ranking in the band 151 to 200, four star on the scale of five by Institutions Innovation Council, Ministry of Education. As we celebrate 60 years of establishment, the college commemorates the efforts taken by the founders of the college, philanthropists, visionaries, principals and faculty who have rendered their services for the growth of the institution for past six decades. The college has launched Vasantrao Dempo Diamond Jubilee Lecture Series. The first lecture was delivered by Honorable Governor of Goa, Shri P. S. Sridharan Pillai, and today we are obliged that an erudite personality, Sri T. V. Mohandas Pai, Padma Shri awardee, has accepted our invitation. Once again, welcome you, sir, and thank you all for joining this event. Thank you, ma'am. I now request the chairman and Dempo Charities Trust, Sri Srinivas Dempo, to present his address as president of this function. Uh, very good evening to one and all. And I would like to add to the welcome of our principal uh, to this uh, event. And Mohan, thanks for doing this. I'm deeply obliged to you. I know how busy you are. You've got uh, a family commitment coming very soon. And you've got so much of work to do. But it was nice of you to do this uh, for us and for the benefit of students. Uh, let me set the context. I was reading a very, very interesting quote last week. And I felt that this would be very apt to set the context for today's talk uh, of Mohan. Uh, they say that data is the new gold now. They say that sitting is the new smoking. They say health is the new wealth. They say failure is the new success. And today's 60 is yesterday's 40. Traveling is the new reading. Religion is the new politics. Social media is the new opium. Exercise is the new wonder drug. And education is the new global currency. So if you look at all the changes that are happening, and why I'm saying this is, we've had 60 years of learning in this college. Uh, thanks to a uh, few individuals like my late grandfather, his brother, and Bausai Bandurkar, who was the first chief minister. This college got set up because of their efforts. And the only way, the only objective was to give quality access to education. To many Goans who had to travel miles away in Mumbai and places like Dalgam, Pune to get educated. And I'm happy to tell you, Mohan, that we've survived for 60 years. And there have been a lot of ups and downs. I mean, you know, it has, you know how education has changed over so many years, but I'm, I must congratulate all my principals who've served for so many years, including the current one, uh, the team of faculty, non-faculty members, and everyone involved in not only surviving this institution, but also blossoming. And I'm happy to tell you, as the principal has said, that we are ranked amongst the top 200 colleges in the country. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that with uh, sort of new orientation now, and that's why we thought that the way to pay tribute to my grandfather and the way to pay tribute to all the people who are involved is to have a lecture series uh, called Conversion of Ideas. And this Conversion of Ideas basically is not only going to help the college, but all its stakeholders. And one of the things that we've learned, and of course it was there pre-COVID, but even in, in COVID it just got accelerated, is the power of digital media and the power that, you know, we talk about valuation of businesses today. We talk about how we can get access to millions of people. And there's only one thing which has you know, given us this is the power of the internet and the connected streams. So this is what I wanted to say. And I think at the end of the day, the students you produce should be employable and skillable. And I was reading somewhere that 10 new skills today are the real challenge for institutions. What are they? The students should be able to learn to solve complex problems. They need to do critical thinking. They need to have creativity. They need to do people's management. They need to coordinate with others very well. You need emotional intelligence in addition to IQ. You need judgment and decision making. You need service orientation. Because at the end of the day, you need to take, and I know Mohan, you're doing an amazing amount of work in terms of community development around you. 
and you need to know the art of negotiation, which very few colleges teach. And last but not the least, you need to have cogn cognitive flexibility. So I think this is where the challenge lies in terms of also the new education policy that is very high on intent, but how do we deliver it? And one of the things that Mohan I wanted to ask you is, how could we use the power of digital medium uh, to sort of, uh, you know, achieve these objectives? So with these few words, I once again welcome all of you and thank you for joining this session. And Mohan, really look forward to some thought-provoking ideas from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for putting things in perspective. We are amidst a business savant and an enlightened mind. Uh, I call upon Assistant Professor Akshita Bhatt to introduce our chief guest, Padma Shri, uh, Shri TV Mohandas Pai. Over to you, Akshita. Very good evening. Uh, it is my honor to acquaint the gathering, uh, especially our young students who are jo joining us on various streams with the inspiring oeuvre of work undertaken by the keynote speaker of the day, uh, Padmashri TV Mohandas Pai. A co-founder of Arin Capital presently, Sir has held several leadership roles in companies and institutions. My young student friends may be particularly interested in his defining contribution to Infosys, where he was a member of the board of directors until June 2011. Joining the company in its formative years as the chief financial officer, he played crucial part in steering the organization uh, to global recognition, particularly by strengthening its branding among investor community. At Invisit, he is also the head of the administration, education, and research sectors, helming initiatives in human resource development and leadership, a role that he took on very keenly. Due to his expertise in planning and implementation of projects of high stature, he has worked closely with union government and state governments in bringing about innovation in education, IT, and business. In view of his stellar work, he has been conferred with the best CFO honors by international and national bodies of esteem. His keen interest in, in the sector of education and community development is evident in many forms. He has been chief advisor to Manipal Education and Medical Group, um, thereby fostering a culture of futuristic learning and research. In the year 2000, he also spearheaded the Midday Meal Program, the outreach of which, dear students, is over 1.2 million school children across states today. Sir's journey is a worthy lesson in how challenges can be identified and turned into opportunities. He pursues this paradigm in the investment sector as well, in fostering India's entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial culture. Arin Capital has played a key role in nurturing expansive platforms that strengthen India's startup ecosystem in areas ranging from life sciences, healthcare, hospitality to education. Today, as India, particularly its younger demography, looks towards opportunities in the digital world, Sir is here with us to share his thoughts on this topic. I'm honored to join my institution in welcoming Padma Shri TV Mohandas Pai. Thank you, Akshita. We are truly privileged to be amidst, to be amidst this, gathering, this online gathering and to be able to listen to you, sir. I hand over this audience to you. We are all wrapped and waiting to listen to your words of wisdom. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Chairman Srinivas Jempo, members of the faculty, students, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you, first of all, for inviting me. It's indeed a great honor to talk to all of you. When I was asked to speak, I thought I should talk to you about what is happening on the world and how the world is going to change. And in fact, it's changing right now. To understand that, let me put a little bit of context. About 250 years ago, 
a seminal event happened in Europe which changed the face of the world at that point of time. And that was the invention of the steam engine. Till then, India China made up the largest part of the global GDP, around 45%. They were the richest countries in the world. And they were the richest countries because they had a large skilled population. They exported their goods, and the whole world came to them to trade. And that's why the Portuguese indeed came to Goa too. But then, between 1500 and maybe 1750, Europeans traded with South America, took the gold of the Incas and the local people there. They traded with Asia to the Arabs and they accumulated capital. So when the steam engine was invented, it marked the rise of the industrial revolution and the rise of the machine age. Now, human beings could make machines which could do the work of 100 people or 1,000 people. So that the rapid expansion of the economy, particularly in Europe, and this led to the rise of Europe, so and so that Europe became the richest part of the world by maybe 1800, 1825. But in 1800 to 1900, Europe dominated the world. They created colonies all across the world. They came and took away the resources of these colonies, subjugated India and China, and became extremely rich. And all this was due to the fact that the Industrial Revolution happened there and they had accumulated capital by trade with Asia in an earlier era. And that Industrial Revolution gave them access to new kind of weapons which revolutionized warfare and allowed them to conquer the world with a small number of people. And then, of course, in the 20th century, we saw the two great wars that destroyed Europe and warfare was on an industrial scale. About 16 million people died in the First World War. 60 million people died in the Second World War. And after the war ended in 1945, with the explosion of the atomic bomb in Nagasaki, in Hiroshima, in Japan, the world embarked on a new era of decolonization and change. But what happened over this last 250 years is... The fact that the Industrial Revolution created a global supply chain, a supply chain to connect producers to consumers all around the world. And this meant that people who control the supply chain made a lot of money, and the supply chain was through shipping, through railways, through pipelines, through retail, wholesale, banking, insurance, etc. In order for you to sell to anybody around the globe, the supply chain. And people in the supply chain made money because the only way to do business to grow the economy was to go through the supply chain to reach consumers all around the world. And that became the centerpiece of control. And that's the economic condition where we have grown up in the last 45, 50 years. But then 20 years ago, something happened which is changing all that. And that was the rise of the internet. What is the internet? It's an electronic platform well, all of us could interact with each other synchronously or asynchronously, and which has enormous amount of information available to us to search and to use. And anybody joining the platform gets networked to a very large number of people who are using the platform to do very many things. To give some data today about the size of this platform and what it means to all of us, the 7.8 billion people on the planet, out of which 6 billion people have a mobile connection, out of which 5.5 billion people are on the internet, 5 billion people possibly are on social media. But the great majority of people are there on the internet. And through the internet, you can give, you can get access to the accumulated knowledge of humankind. All the books that have been written since history began, you can find it on the internet, almost free of cost. You can listen to the best lectures and the best professors. You have enormous amount of education other videos on the internet. You can do business on the internet globally. You can do banking services. You can get health advices and the health advice from the best doctors on the planet. And you can do this asynchronously, asynchronously. Synchronously means what we are doing now in real time. Asynchronously means you can always go at a time of your leisure. 
So you are open to the world 24 by 7 through the internet and all you need is a mobile phone, a smartphone and a cheap data connection. And that's why today 6 billion people have a mobile connection and 5.5 billion people are on the internet. A large amount of business is being done on the internet. You can imagine what happened when there's a lockdown globally starting last February in China. When the world locked down, people stayed at home to start, stop the spread of the pandemic. And that meant that people got their supplies and the groceries through e-commerce. They spoke to the doctors to video. Children got education to a tech company sitting at home in front of the PC or the laptop. You got entertainment to the OTT platform where you saw movies. You got access to music. And you did very many things like play games or possibly do other activities all on the internet. And everybody took to it like ducks take to water. And that changed the way people think and people behave. And suddenly the world was in the midst of the digital revolution. And today the world is in the midst of a digital revolution. Almost everything that we do is driven by the digital world, driven by cheap data, driven by huge capacities in the cloud for storage, driven by artificial intelligence and machine learning, driven by automation, driven by rich video, and driven by bandwidth, which is available to you all across at any point of time. Uh, does India play a great role in this? Yes. Let me give some data. Out of 1.38 billion people in India, one point, there are 1.2 billion mobile phones, 1 billion people have a unique mobile phone. Some have two or three. I'm sure many of you do. And then we have 750 million people on the internet. So somebody tells you, in the digital world ranking, India is 35 or 40. Don't believe them because there are only two countries with more than 300 million people on the internet, that is China and India. In fact, you should not compare the small countries in the UK or Germany with India, but compare them with Karnataka and possibly Tamil Nadu, etc. So India has adopted the digital revolution with a vengeance, and today we're seeing enormous amount of work being done. In 2019, the world spent two trillion dollars on a world GDP of 82 trillion on digital automation, and this year they're probably spending two and a half trillion. Enormous amount of capital and money is going to make the world a very different place. And what has been the impact on the world? If you look at the most valuable companies in the world. The most valuable company is Microsoft, worth 2.4 trillion. 2.4 trillion is just short of the cap of the GDP of this country, which is close to three trillion dollars today. And Apple is 2.3, and then we saw that uh, Google also, Google or Alphabet, crossed two trillion dollars. Can you imagine a company with two trillion dollars, and all the big digital companies who are digital monopolies make something like 250, 300 billion dollars of profits every year. Suddenly, the world has changed in the last three years, and everything has gone digital, and unless you are part of it, you'll be lost. Now, what are the implications for everybody when the world goes digital, and what is going to happen in the near future? First of all, when the world goes digital, all our data will be present in the database or in the data structures of the big digital companies. Apple has 2 billion people on his iOS system. Google has 2.5 billion on his, on his Android system. That means everything you do on the web using Apple or Google or an Android device is stored in the database, and all of us have become a piece of data. So Google knows what you do, what you eat, what you see, what you read, everything about you, and Google can manipulate your mind and send you things that you don't want to do, but you're forced to do because you believe that's what you want to do. In fact, when you go to Google and search, what Google sends to you as part of the search is what Google wants you to see, not what you want to see. Because that's the way it is all structured. So all of us have become piece of data, part of a network, and the network grows with the addition of every single person, and that is becoming more and more powerful. And then... The new thing that people are talking about is the metaverse, where all of us will have a digital presence on the web, and the reality between a physical presence and the digital presence is going to merge. And very soon we'll be offline, online, and 
we will go in between the two at the switch of a button without thought. If you look at a young child today and see how they use digital technologies and use the internet and manipulate data and do things, you'll be very surprised that they're born to the digital world. Many of us are older, I've seen the world in a very different place and many of other change habits. But for young children today and almost all of you in school, a large part of what they do is very, very digital and that is going to continue for a period of time. Now, what has made the digital world come true? The digital world has become big and has come true because of many advances in technology. First of all, the speed of computing has enormously changed. Today, we've got high-speed computing, high-speed data available. Most of the data is stored in the cloud. Cloud means aggregation of server capacity in different parts. So you don't have to, have to buy a server. You don't have to set up a data center. All of you can just click, pay a little bit of money, and you're on the cloud. You get almost unlimited capacity at the lower price and cost of crash to just 5% of what the data cost was maybe 20 years ago. So the enormous increase in the capacity of computing data, in the capacity of storage, and in the cost of the device. I remember in 1994, we used to buy a Pentium 4 PC, a big optical device for $2,500. Now you can get something 100 times that power, 1,000 times the power for maybe $500. Somebody told me that the Apple new device has more computing power than the crazy supercomputer seven years ago. That's the kind of strides that computing technology has taken, driven by lower costs, better performance, huge amounts of data available at a very low cost. And today, Indians consume 17 GB of data per person. 17 GB of data for a billion people every single month. And 95% and of everybody on the internet sees videos. They look at content. They spend six and a half hours on the internet. I don't know how much time you're spending on the internet. I hope you're not doing more. As young people, you have to go out and play and talk to people and go for long walks and play sports. For God's sake, don't get stuck to your device all the time. It's not good for you. Maybe for older people like, you know, me, I don't want to use other names here. They're not old enough like me. Maybe you need to spend more time inside, but you've got to be outside. You are younger and you've got to see the mountains and go to the beach and do all the nice, exciting things you do when you're young. So there's enormous amount of capacity come up. Now we're going to enter into quantum computing where you're going to have speed some computing 5x of what you have today. And quantum computing is going to be driven by 5G and 6G. 5G means speed goes up on your mobile device by a factor of 10 times, 20 times, depending on where you are and costs come down. So download speeds and everything can come down. Second point which I want to talk about is the reason for the change is the rise of automation and artificial intelligence and machine learning. What does it mean? Artificial intelligence is an algorithm, a software return, which sifts to enormous amount of data and which can recognize patterns and do a lot of work that human beings do. Remember, all of us follow patterns. All of us follow precedent. All of us do things which are rule-based. Rule-based means you go from one, two, three, four, five, and you get the desired result. A machine can be taught to be rule-based and do all that using an algorithm, provided you have enough computing power and you are computing, computing data storage, which is available today very cheap. So people are writing algorithms, and this allows machines to do 60% of the work that human beings can do. For example, if you go to a tech company, you want to do a mass problem, all you have to do is... Uh, go to the portal and start doing the problems and you'll have a chat bot who will recognize your voice and speak to you like a human-like voice and correct the mistake that you move, make because in mathematics, you have to follow certain steps to get the result, right? A plus B squared equals A squared plus B squared by 2AB, two, two right? So you got to you understand all that and I'm sure you'll do that well. So there are rules there are rules which you have to follow to give you the desired uh, outcome. And I think that is something that machines can do much better and do it again and again and again with less fault than a human being does because machines can work 24 into 7. Along with that, there is something called machine learning by which you train a machine. What does it do? 
Now imagine you are watching me on video. What happens? You are seeing an image on video of a particular person speaking to you. Now you may recognize the image because you've seen a photograph of the person or met the person. That means the image of the person is stored in your brain. You have 82 billion neurons in your brain. And the image is stored. So instantaneously, your eyes capture the image. It goes to the retina. From the back of the retina, it goes to the nerves and goes to your brain. The neurons connect. And immediately, you say, this is so-and-so. Why you've seen them before? Now, machines have cameras where they can see all the images. The images are stored in the you know, capacity, in the, in the storage area of the machine. And the machine compares this image with the images of the machine and comes and tells you, yes, this is the picture of the particular person. And that's how we get facial recognition. Facial recognition means the camera captures the image, takes the image, sends it to a server, and the server in the cloud compares that and comes back and say, this is so-and-so person because the image is stored. A machine can be taught to recognize objects, recognize animals, recognize human beings, recognize cars, etc. And once the machines are able to recognize, they can do a lot of work. And that leads to the rise of robots. Robots are humanoid machines, whereby a machine can do much of the work that human beings do. For example, repetitive tasks like electronic assembly, they can lift heavy equipment, they can walk, they can run. For example, Boston Dynamics has got a mechanical cheetah which can do 65 kilometers. They got a mechanical horse which can draw a cart. You might have seen all that. They got a robo which can do a backflip. They got a robo which can play football, a robo which can dance, a robo which can do so many things because they've all been trained how to do it. Please remember, the human being is a very complex animal. There are so many things happening. The flexibility in your fingers, the ability of your brain to recognize images, the ability of your brain to connect, the memory capacity you have is very, very unique and very, very huge. All that is being duplicated in the form of robots who are trained to see with cameras, capture the image and use the image to process and do many things and send signals across the robot to move his legs, move his hand, lift and do many things. And once it keeps doing that, it'll keep doing that all the time. Srini and I, along with Aima, went to see the Tesla factory in Fremont, United States. And we saw large robots which are manufacturing cars. If we go to a car factory today, there are no human beings. A friend of mine went to a factory in China, which is one kilometer in depth by half a kilometer wide. It's very dark. And the friend asked the person there, oh, do you have a holiday today? He said, no, they're all working. Where are they? They have only machines working. Machines don't require light. Machines don't require light because they're by mathematical formulae. They can move their hands, move their widgets all around the place because the distance are covered and they can see in the dark, right? By using particular technology, night vision, and they can make things happen. And the entire production was automated. It went out, robots lifted it, put into a truck, and the truck drove by itself. In Germany, trucks are driven without a driver for 1,000 kilometers. There are autonomous cars coming where cars can drive by themselves. And Tesla has a great degree of automation. The car has become a piece of software. So you're going to have artificial intelligence, machine learning, which is going to change. And 60 to 70% of human activity can be done by machines in the near future. They're well on the way to achieving that in a very, very big way. And robots are going to do much of the work that people do, driving cars, working in the factory, you know, pulling cars, you know, and many things else that human beings do, and that's going to happen much faster than we think. The next thing that's going to happen with the automation is the availability of information on your fingertips. Now, when we went to college, we sat before a teacher in a class of 50, 60 people. The teacher had read all the books. So they came and taught us, and we learned we noted down some things, we listened, whatever they spoke was captured and stored in a hard disk in your mind, and then we could recall it. At the end of the term, we went, they asked us a question, we wrote down everything faithfully, they gave a mark sheet, and they gave us a ranking, and we went with a piece of paper, a degree, and we got jobs and possibly work. Now, that is the education model of the Industrial Revolution, where there was a need for people who had a certain amount of skills and knowledge, so they all went to college or school and teachers taught them and they got a must card and that gave them the skills to communicate, to do some arithmetic, to read and write and to work and to think, etc. in a very structured manner. Now, much of the information that's given to you in schools and colleges is information available freely on the web. 
you have to memorize it you have to store it in a hard disk no you can always go to the web and search for anything and everything will be available to you if you have a query you can put the query on quora or somewhere else and they will answer you can look at rich videos which will do that you can take your class at midnight at 2 o'clock in the morning you don't have to go to school but in so and so period because that information is there so that information part of education is taken care of by this automation availability the enormous amount of information is available on the web and that means every human being has access to the information in the industrial revolution only those people who read books who went to college had access because they were all in the form of books in the library everything is available on the web so the explosion of information the explosion of interaction the explosion of rich multimedia is going to change the way we think and we work and all this is coming together in a very significant manner now in this new world what are the skills that we need to survive to grow and to prosper are we all going to be deprived of economic opportunities because machines are going to do work are the rich going to grow richer is there going to be accumulation of wealth in a few hands are we going to lose our jobs are we going to do many things are we not able to do many things that we could do well i think and my view is that automation and technology are going to be inputs to make us more productive yeah, many of the jobs that are available will go away for example in india over the last 20 years banks have grown 10 times their size profits have gone possibly two or three times because of bad debts but then employment has grown only 5% 10 times the size but employment has grown only 5% so the employment intensity in our economic growth is coming down that means jobs are going to be very different different kind of skills are going to be required and the same kind of jobs are not going to come for example there were jobs in call centers 5 7 years ago now you go to a call center there could be a chat bot or a automated piece of software which will answer all your queries and guide you because that piece of software will be able to recognize your voice will be able to understand what you're saying will be able to translate your language into multiple languages you see the famous ad where a person goes to japan and speaks into the mobile in english and out comes the japanese asking questions in japanese right so language translation into any funny language is going to be easier so a lot of things are going to happen in that way so in this new world what are the skills that we need first of all i think we have to go back to basics what makes a human being unique a human being is unique because they're curious look at a young child a young child when he's born when he grows up starts crawling and walking he's so curious he asks the question looks at everything with uh, curiosity learns touches feels puts in his mouth and learns and when you see the child it's amazing to see what the child does and how the child learns the child retains curiosity when the child become 3 to 4 we put the poor child into a school in their play school then the teacher comes and tell the child do 1 2 3 4 the child gets beaten up at the time they go to class 5 or 6 sadly the child's curiosity is gone because we have a structured mode of education and very soon the child is told to do a certain thing in certain way and curiosity diminishes so in this new world we have to be curious we have to retain our curiosity all our age all our life because curiosity will mean that you will be have a learning ability throughout your life your mind will be alive you want to see what is happening learn what is happening and the curiosity will allow you to have a problem solving attitude the most important asset a human being can have is to be curious and have a problem solving attitude because in life we come across many problems so when you come across a problem how do you solve the problem you look at the problem you analyze the problem and you look at the data behind the problem then you come out with three or four solutions apply the data to the solutions pick the one which is most likely to solve the problem and say this is the way we have to go and that's what managers do that's what engineers do that is what teachers do because in a class if a child is not studying the teacher has to understand why the child is not studying what are the issues and motivate the child to study and structure the course program in such a way the child can study with a problem solving attitude so we must have a problem solving attitude which is only there if we retain curiosity so education system has to change to make sure the child remains curious throughout the schooling and leaves the class school with a basic amount of information and knowledge but a very curious problem solving attitude more projects more self learning guiding from the teacher less structured information and more time to do things on their own and to understand rather than unnecessary information being forced down the throat and examination system will be based upon how problems have to be solved the next thing we need to understand 
is basically how to use technology because technology is going to permeate all our life now we know that older people when the lockdown happened went to the mobile and could buy everything and do everything they never tried to learn the skill but they buy bought it because much of the software was intuitive that intuitive kind of works so we learn how to use technology not be slaves to technology but learn how to use technology to have a more productive life and to have a better quality of life and to be more productive so technology is going to be there in every facet of work we got to learn how to use the technology to become more productive next is we must develop life skills which are going to be very important communication ability to think and to communicate ability to interact with people ability to work together with everybody else in a team ability to network etc because as problem solvers we will have to mobilize resources to solve our problems and the only way that can happen if we are able to network we are able to communicate we are able to have life skills and that i think is going to be extremely extremely important and that will come when we only learn certain skills which allow us to compete and allow us to live in a very different kind of society the next thing which is required in my personal opinion is an ability to live in any part of the world so many of us are living in a particular environment we are very comfortable because that environment nurtures us but now when the opportunities to work in the environment becomes less you have to look at the entire world as a platform and learn to live and work in any part of the world it doesn't mean that you have to travel what happened during the covid lockdown around the world was employees were working in factories and working together went away to their homes and everybody started working using video conferencing and digital tools right so today the world has become a common network where people can live in any part of the world and communicate to each other and work irrespective of time zone differences that means you can work for your somebody in the us and somebody in the us can work for you and you can get access to all kind of talent all over so you should have an ability to understand the cultural dissimilarities and similarities between people and the ability to talk communicate and work in different parts of the world you should have multicultural skills and the self confidence and ability to do that very well next is a curious mind will lead to lifelong learning please remember knowledge will be obsolete very very soon in whatever you do whatever work you do today may not be there 3 to 4 years from now the machine may be doing it so you have to learn new skills that means lifelong education lifelong skilling has to be something and if you have the basic basic building blocks like a curious mind good communication skills and a problem solving attitude you can learn new skills and you can be ahead of the game and that means you should be able to learn lifelong and retain the curiosity because if you think that you're going to learn something that's going to be adequate for rest of your life is not enough because things are going to change today innovation cycles have come down from 36 months to 18 months that means every 18 months thing change pokemon took 19 days to come to 15 million users aishman bharat our our aishman think our health stack our health uh, you know app is taken 13 days to come to uh, 50 million people and one point of time the airline industry took 60 years to come to uh, 15 million people the internet took some 14 years to come to 15 million people so today the pace of change is very rapid globally because the innovation is coming up new things are coming up is very difficult to keep pace that means unless you have lifelong learning and a problem solving attitude you will not be able to keep up and lastly we must be very careful that we don't lose our human skills as human beings what makes it apart empathy an ability to interact with people ability to live with people ability to be emotional and to connect with people emotionally and in a large ability to be compassionate and live together in so- in society not at the cost of others but helping others as a community so this feeling of community the feeling of humanness should be very 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 well to be done in a big way and to be the biggest danger to humanity and to all of us is that we will go inwards into technology and become loners that's because we spend a lot of time with our device lot of time on electronic gadget and doing that 
the electronic gadget opens up to the world. We don't feel the need to talk to people, to move with people, interact with people, communicate with people, because everything can be done electronically through video, and you can do everything in full day. You don't have to go outside. You don't have to, you know, go to the beach or sit in the sun or anything like that. You can be inside, and that makes you insular. The beauty of human being is the social interaction, ability to be together, talk to each other, have a nice cup of tea. Now, those are important because as a part of what you become as a human being, you develop that human skills and you must never lose that and become inward looking. That's why the metaverse, that is a new environment people are talking about is something that is astounding to a person like me who's worked in technology for 30 years and also shocking. I hope we don't become victims. So technology should not become a master. Technology should be a tool that we use to make our lives better and the life society better. And technology should never become a master because technology becomes a master. All of us are lost. In uh, China and in uh, Japan, many young people are staying in a room the entire life and not going out. They're, they're, they're lost. They're, they're lost their ability to interact with people. They lost their ability to communicate with people. They lost their ability to be in a group. And it's all gone. They all look to the device and they see the world. And the world has become the distinction between the human being and a robot or a widget or an algorithm has got lost. And now we have, people are saying we'll come close to singularity where artificial intelligence and those technology will develop human-like skills and will be indistinguishable from human beings. Is the time going to come? It may come. It may take seven years, eight years, whatever it is. But that's going to happen. So we have to be prepared for the day. So we must make sure that we retain our humanness and the human qualities that keep us apart because we are very, very unique. So I want to say that if you want to live and survive in the digital world, first you must be aware of what is happening, how the world is changing, how the world has changed, and what is going to come in the future by being well-read. Second, you must develop those qualities that allow you to prosper, curiosity, lifelong learning, problem-solving attitude, communication, life skills, cross-culture skills, etc. And then you must be able to adjust to new circumstances and treat the world as a single stage. And lastly, not lose your human humanness and your connection with people and be very people-focused and learn not to let technology become your master, but technology should become a tool for you to do things better. I think all these things are required. So we have to change the way. And the way to change is in the schools. We have to change the way we teach young people. We have to change the way we interact with people. We have to reduce the curriculum load. We have to retain the curiosity. And we have to make them adapt in technology. And that is how, how I think we will learn to live in the digital world. So I want to thank you for inviting me and uh, listening to me. And I'll be very happy to answer any questions that you might have so that, you know, we can have a good engaging conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. You have taken us on a journey uh, tracing the impacts and changes post the industrial revolution, the arrival of the internet, the numerous pros as a result of it, uh, and the establishment of the digital state. Uh, but most importantly, you've highlighted other new skills that students and even we as, you know, as teachers need to highlight upon and incorporate. I hope our students have made note of those uh, new skills. And dear students, please remember, keep your curiosity alive. Not my words, the words of Padma Shri Mohandas. Bye. Okay, and students and listeners, you may now uh, type your questions in the chat box or you may unmute your microphone and ask questions. The question and answer session begins. Sir, yes. I, I have one question. So, yes. uh, what India should do? So, uh, our, our, own Microsoft. our chairman has raised his hand, sir. Would you like to ask the first question? So I, I think let him finish and then I'll, I'll ask. I want your input. What India should do to have our own companies like Microsoft, Google, and Apple? No, India has its companies. Let me give you some data. Uh, you know, India has 55,000 startups, 75 unicorns, 35 unicorns came up today. The value of this, all the startups, is about $400 billion. 15 lakh people are employed. 
We have invested about $85 billion since 2014. And by 2025, we'll have more than 100,000 startups. They will create a trillion dollars of value. And they will have at least 200 unicorns. So India is growing. But you must remember, Microsoft, Google, and Apple came up only in the United States, not in Europe, not in Japan. Why is that the United States got $22 trillion GDP? They got huge amounts of capital, a big digital market of $2 trillion. Europe is smaller. Europe doesn't have the giant company except SAP. And Japan has almost nothing except Nintendo, right? So India is a consumer of apps and a producer of apps in the digital world. And the digital world, India will soon become the third largest economy after the United States, China, and India. So India is doing reasonably well for an economy of this size. Yes, we don't have a Google and Microsoft, a giant companies that happen in a particular environment that doesn't exist in this country. And I think if you look at our software companies, we export $170 billion of software, more software than the oil exported by Saudi Arabia. 50 lakh people are employed. Out of 60 lakh people employed in software in America, 10 lakh are Indians. Out of the 50 lakhs here, 25 lakh work for American companies. Out of 85 lakh working for American companies globally, 35 lakh are Indians. Of the top 10 software service companies, the market value, five are Indian. Of the top five, three are Indian. Of the 28 lakh employees in the top 10 global companies, 20 lakh are Indian. So we have done very well for a country of our size. Are we going to have the giant companies? No, we are a smaller economy, but we are part of the global ecosystem. And I'm very confident India will do very, very well. For example, in Bangalore, out of 1.1 crore people, 20 lakh people work in technology. This year, we're getting 2.5 lakh to 3 lakh jobs. We got about 30,000 IT companies, 10,000 startups. We got 40 unicorns in Bangalore. So India is doing very well. I want to Goa to do well too. I hope Goa does well. Thank you, sir. Mohan, if I may ask you two questions. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, Every time I listen to you, I learn something new. So I must have listened to you at least on more than 20 occasions now. And uh, it's really, you know, I don't know how you do this. One way you say that you don't have to memorize everything, but the kind of data that is stored in your mind computer is phenomenal. I mean, really, congratulations on that. I had two questions. One is, uh, you know, and I think you've, you've given a very good insight into what sort of skills will be required and how jobs will change. Do you think Indian educational institutes are doing enough in terms of investing their resources? Because, you know, I sit on the board of Carnegie Mellon and the stuff that is happening there in terms of technology-led initiatives like AI and, you know, machine learning. Do we have equivalence? Because we have the IITs of the world in India. Are we doing enough? And my second question is, are companies like us doing enough? in terms of investing in R&D, in terms of reskilling its people. Because I think a lot of reskilling will be required. We won't even know what will hit us below the belt very soon. And I, to my mind, I don't think companies are doing enough. So just wanted your views on this. Well, in the education sphere, we are certainly not doing enough because we don't have enough public funding for research. You know, Srini, much of what happens in the United States is funded by the government and now largely by companies. And they've been doing it for the last 50 years. Our funding is just about 5,500 crores for the universities, very, very little. We've not been able to do that. Hopefully, the new program of the National Research Foundation, which promises to invest 10,000 crores in India, will help. But suddenly, we're not doing enough. And uh, all our universities are not research-based universities, the great majority. Only maybe 15, 20 are research-based. They're all teaching universities. And teaching universities have a limitation. We'll create uh, good engineers, but, you know, we'll not be able to be do cutting edge research. We will not have the creation of knowledge. We'll have the dissemination of knowledge, not the creation of knowledge, unless we spend more money. And is it going to change in the next 10 years? No, it will change a little bit. But we're not going to see a dramatic improvement because, you know, we have to reorient our savings, our spending. We are a poor country. There will be pockets of excellence that will happen, but uh, hopefully it will get bigger. But certainly we're not doing enough. Are companies doing enough to, re to, to do R&D? I think the drug companies are doing more and more. The IT companies are doing more and more. The auto companies are doing more and more. A lot of things are happening. But much of the innovation happening in the startup companies because capital is coming from outside. This year, the startups are spending $15, 20000000000 billion 
Okay, they're creating product, they're creating a lot of things. For example, electric vehicles, we're going to have two wheelers. We're going to be the largest producer of two wheeler vehicles, uh, two wheeler, four wheeler cars, maybe in the next two or three years. We're not going to be good like Tesla, but we'll come up close because they don't have to go through everything that Tesla does. So, a lot of things are happening, and there is much more optimistic because there's a lot more money and there's competition, so there'll be greater innovation. Are people reskilling everybody? No, uh, because, you know, frankly, you know, I, you know, Srini, I would hate to be 40, 45 at this point of time, honestly, in industry. Because I'm 40, 45, I lose my job, I won't get any more jobs. It's going to be very difficult. We are getting two and a half crore people in this country reach their age of 21 every year. One and a half crore people want jobs. The young people are going to be high. And today, they're going to be more adept in technology. They know what is happening. That somebody who has spent 20, 25 years doing the same thing in a very comfortable way. Because the world was a very different place. So I think it's going to be a big challenge for people who are older and even for companies, they will just shed people and take fresh people instead of training the same people. Because remember, uh, you know, a lot of automation is going to happen. When automation happens, the needs for individual discretion will go down. Your factories are going to be fully automated, robotic led. What will you do with more workers? Will you buy a robot to do more work or will you train your old and older workers for 45, 50, you've worked it for 20 years? Now, this is going to be a big social issue. So I don't have a solution except that you must grow fast enough to create more jobs so that automation will come, but it will be slower so that more people will keep it. But I think that they have to train. But the, but the IT companies are training, CD. We've seen an enormous amount of IT companies training people. And that, I think, is unbelievable. Because remember, when uh, COVID hit, a lot of money was spent on training, and at least about uh, 25 lakh or the 50 lakh people have been trained in big data and use of AI. Thank you. Thanks, Moon. In fact, uh, for your schools and colleges, you must sit down and think and look at the new education policy because the solution is there. In the new education policy, the curriculum load has come down, project work has to go up, more time for thinking and doing has to go up. And uh, that will give more time to the teachers and to the students to do the thing that are interesting, to give the kind of skills that they require. Second, you must uh, they get access to more technology and content and lectures so they can do much more self-study. And in classes, they can discuss many things because the more you discuss, the more you talk, the more you interact, the more, you know, learning comes. You know, Srini, curiously, in, in the old world, there was the Gurukula and the Academy of Greece where you taught with the teacher, you discussed, you debated, and everybody mind work. Then the classes became larger. Now we have to go back to the old method in a very different way. There'll be more interaction in the class, more discussion, more communication, more handwork, less uh, pushing uh, information down somebody's throat so that the product will be uh, somebody who learns and they want. Yes, very true. Thank you. Thank you. I think Thank there you, are some questions. So there's a question. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's a question in the chat box from Dr. K.S. Rani. Uh, he asks how farmers fit into this machine-oriented world. Uh, they still have to depend on natural phenomenon, rains, for example. So how do they fit in? Well, I think farmers can fit in very well if they use technology. And all you have to do is look at Israel. Israel is one of the largest producers of agriculture goods and exporter. They are in a very dry area. Then you look at the uh, Netherlands. Netherlands is very, very wet, but using technology, they become the largest exporter of fruits and vegetables in the world. How do they do in a short, small landmass? They use technology. For example, today, you can grow fruits and vegetables in vertical factories inside a warehouse. You don't have to be open, right? And then even in the farm today, you can use technology. For example, let me tell you what you can do. Uh, you can um, you know, take the soil condition and you can make sure that you plant the seed at the right time and you can water it using drip micro irrigation, the right amount of water. You can look at weather forecasts and take that information to make sure that, uh, you know, the watering is done properly. Uh, you know the weather forecast, what is going to come. You can run drones across and people are doing it to understand the state of the crop and the many things else. And your productivity can go up if you're able to get a better price. So I think technology has radically changed the way agriculture is done. And many places in America today, tractors don't require human beings. Tractors are running on the own, plowing and cutting the crop and doing everything else, run by robots and uh, cameras, right? So I think farm, farming also has changed uh, dramatically in a very different way. Uh, but is it a solution for everybody? No, because we have a large number of people on farming. It will be a very slow process. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, we had a question from uh, Christina D'Souza, which was, uh, how can those in rural India use and benefit from digitalization? Which I think sir has answered. Um, is the, uh, maybe Christina, if you want to rephrase that, we could uh, handle that question a little later. Uh, Snehal Harmalkar has put in a question. Uh, from software development perspective, how do we keep up with the rising trends and you know customer user expectations? Well, I think we're keeping it up because we produce this for the whole world, right? We have become the center of software for the whole world. Come to Bangalore, you'll see what is happening. The whole world gets this software written in India. And if you look at all the startups and what they're doing, it is, it is better than what you have in the America, Japan, or somewhere else. In fact, we're far ahead of uh, Japan in many areas. Uh, what we lack is cutting edge technology like AI, where we are two years behind Silicon Valley. But uh, we are part of the network. And I think, you know, there we don't have any challenge. Let me answer the rural thing, because, you know, we have this feeling, oh, people in villages and rural areas are left out. They are behind. How will they interact? Now, look, there's wireless everywhere. You got a mobile phone, a smartphone, which costs 6,000, 7,000, and most people can afford to buy. Or maybe all of you can give a gift to them, or your chief minister can give a gift as part of the elections. And they've got a data plan with Reliance at 100 rupees a month. They can pay 100 rupees. They connect it. They get the same lectures, same education, same everything else. They can, you know, so much of things is free, right? So there's no distinction between rural, urban, everything else. All that is gone because you're part of the network. So all the distinction from the world is becoming flat. I think uh, Cindy had raised her hand. Do you want to ask your question? Cindy De Silva? As we wait for Cindy, I will put up a question that's uh, been posed by Ashish Prabhugankar. He asks, how to motivate students to explore authentic information, wealth available on internet, and also keep them away from incorrect and misguiding information? Well, the only way I think we can do that is to have greater interaction with them in the classroom, right? Because you remember, see, we are bombarded with information. We always been bombarded. We've been brought up to read newspapers and to believe everything is written in the newspaper is correct. It is not so because we didn't have an alternative. Today, we have so much of alternative, we still don't know what is authentic. We were in a state of ignorance earlier because somebody curated the information, gave it to us, we trusted them and believed them. Now we got so much and nobody is curating or everybody is curating that we are lost. So we have been lost for a long period of time. So how do we make sure it's authentic? We can only be done by discussing in the classroom, raising the topic and developing the judgment skills for people. I think that is not very difficult because the more you discuss, the more you understand. All of us will look for authentic news and there are many web pages which are authentic because they want a competitive difference. And I think it is not something that, uh, uh, you know, that will uh, evade us. But you know, we all fall victims to fake information. But we have been falling victims to propaganda and fake information for all our lives. Except we didn't know about it. No, we know about it because somebody is going to question that. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's a question from Shilpa Naik. Where does the state of Goa stand currently in this digitization phase? And what are the challenges? You know, I, I want to be honest with the challenge with Goa has always been leadership. Goa is a small state, 14 lakh people. Very high quality human capital. Very less higher education, less research, not exposed to technology. And I don't know why everybody rebels and say, oh, the Govan way of life or sun and you know, uh, prawn curry and, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, funny and we can drink and go to the beach and fun. That's not your life. You do a lot more things than that. That image, oh, we are fun and frolic, is just diluting what Goa is. To my mind, Goa should become the intellectual center, the technology center of India, where every Goan, young Goan can get a high quality opportunity to realize the dream sitting in Goa, right? That's what you should do because you've got only 14 lakh people. In Bangalore, we've got 1.1 crore people. Okay, you are in a small state with good people, but most of the young people don't get job. They have to go out. Like my, like this, like Mangalore, where the Konkani people are in Karnataka, is becoming a city of old people because there are no jobs. I fear that Goa will become a place where 
older people remain, younger people are going. For the last two generations, younger people have been going out because you have not been able to develop the economy. So I've been, uh, I've met um, uh, Bernard Parikar earlier, and it's very good uh, to say that why don't you develop a strategy where you invest in people, invest in technology, invest in human capital, and create a service-based, environmentally friendly economy where you're highly skilled people and you can treat the whole world as a platform to do all the things that you want. In Bangalore, there are 20 lakh people in technology. If Goa has one or two lakh people in technology, your economy will be three times the size and create a lot more jobs. Now, do you want all the students to come and wash on the street and do all the things that they do in Goa? We don't want that, right? I mean, I've been coming to Goa since 1969. Because remember, Goa for a Konkani is my Dharma Bhumi. My, my Janma Bhumi is Bangalore. My Karma Bhumi is Bangalore. My Dharma Bhumi is Goa. All of us love Goa. We are all Konkani. Most of us are Konkani, right? We love Goa. So Goa should develop. Goa lacks the leadership to develop. I've been telling Srini for long that he must take up the leadership, advise the chief minister and others. But, you know, he's slightly reluctant. So I think Goa should really, really reorient his strategy, become a place uh, which is going to be a leader for the whole world and create a very different Goa. Thank you, sir. Uh, this next question has been posed on uh, YouTube. Gaurang Bane asks, uh, can automation make software engineering jobs obsolete? Yeah, m much of the job can be obsolete, yes. But the newer jobs will come up, but much of the jobs can be obsolete because a lot of the code can be written by machines and algorithms today. Happening. Mohit uh, Suptankar asks, uh, the government has a proactive role to play in the process. But what about the socialist hangover the Indian state suffers from where the government and bureaucrats begin to get too involved in everything? Well, you know, for Goa, you require 10 people to change Goa in the next 10 years. A good leader who's going to be a chief minister, two or three good ministers is enough because you're a small state. What, do you, what, what are the things that you need to do? You need to make sure that Goa becomes a digital state where every house is wired, every person has a device and high-speed internet. Okay, so you're connected to the world. Second is in schools and colleges, you have to bring in technology to expose them to what is happening around the world. Third thing, which is very important, you must teach coding to students as an additional skill in addition to reading, writing, arithmetic. Right, is an additional skill. So you'll be skilled. And the fourth thing is, you must create an investment place where young people can be innovative and start their own companies and start doing many digital things. And fifth thing is, you must create a place where your skilled people can do work sitting in Goa for the entire world. So there are a few things that can be done and it's not very large. If uh, out of 14 lakh people, 1 lakh, 2 lakh uh, work in the new economy, you will transform Goa. Thank you for that, sir. There's a question from Chandan Naik. How can students or users focus on using technology to learn and not only for social media? Well, you can learn because, you know, look, my younger son used to look at all the technology videos. He's a CA and he became a better techie than other people. He knew more about the world than most people. See, all of you have got curiosity. All of you are young. Your students are young. You know, learn, you know, be curious. Why do atoms, atoms move in a particular way inside the nuclei, right? How is energy created? How can we make sure that we have new materials which can transform the world? How can we make sure we have much more energy? You ask those fundamental questions, go to the web, do some research, understand, and then, you know, you learn so much. So everything is available for you. So I think, you know, the, all the limitations that people of my generation had of lack of access to information and knowledge is not there for you. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's a question from the fearless soul. Uh, the, they ask, how do you see spiritualism and technology? Can they well, both go we, hand in hand? No, they don't go hand in hand. They do different. That's why we need more spirituality in a sense because, you know, technology dehumanizes you. Technology dehumanizes you. Technology makes you a widget. Technology induces you and makes you a captive. I'm making strong statements. That's my experience and my view. And technology makes you more lonely. 
Technology creates islands, not continents. So spirituality hopefully will expose your mind to bigger questions, bigger challenges about human existence and temper down technology so that you become a better human being. See, spirituality is ultimately part of what a human being is, whatever you might say. It doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not. That is a very different issue. But spirit, spirituality makes you more human. It, it, it enables you to have compassion, enables you to be at peace with yourself, enables you to discover yourself and understand the purpose of your life. So I think it's important. And that's why, you know, you should have enough spirituality and exposure so technology does not dominate your life. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, this is the last question that we will be taking by Ankita Desai. They ask, um, what kind of digital startups may be started in Goa? And could you give some examples? Oh, anything. You can start uh, digital startups using AI. You can start a digital, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, digital startups which uh, are technology-based in the SaaS model, in HR, in fintech, in anything else which can tackle the entire, uh, entire globe. Uh, you can have uh, digital startups which uh, sell you technology, right? There are there are there are hundred ways. There are hundred ways. For example, you can do AR, VR, or, you know, augmented reality and virtual reality software. You can write. So there are there are upteen number of all the things that you can do. For example, even if you start an e-commerce company, you know, it can be for the entire world because on the internet everything can be done, right? Everything can be done because access is open to everybody. There's no limitations on what you can do. But limitations will be to have the people to do it. You have the people to do it. You have the technology people. There also, you can stay in Goa and get people from around the world to work for you and on your virtual platform. So you're not limited by Goa. You're not limited by Bangalore. But you need capital. Can you access capital? If you're smart and you have a great idea, you can pitch to venture capitalists and get capital. You can do anything anywhere. Why is anybody do it? everybody doing everything everywhere? Because the market today can be all the world. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, the question and answer round, I think, went very well. Thank you for answering the queries that our friends and participants had. Uh, I request the vice principal of our institution, Mrs. Manjuri Barve, to propose the vote of thanks. Madam? You're muted. You're muted. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. Respected listeners, I wish to place before you the words of gratitude on behalf of the management and principal of DCT's Dente College of Arts and Science. We are towards the end of the second lecture of the Vasant Rao Depo Diamond Shubiri Lecture Series, where ideas converge. Today's theme was succeeding in the digital world, and the speaker being Sri TV Mohandas Pai. Padmashri Awardee, Chairman, Arin Capital Partners, former CFO and member of the Board of Enforcers Limited. It gives me great, great pleasure in thanking you, sir, for being with us on this occasion and sharing your views and thoughts and taking us in a journey through the digital world with this August gathering in an online mode. Thank you, sir, and looking out for more interactions in the future. I wish to thank our chairman, Sri Srinivas Dempo, sir, for initiating the Basant Rao Dempo Diamond Jubilee Lecture Series and also for addressing the gathering today. My words of gratitude to our administrator, Sri Rajesh Vadkar, sir, who is our driving force for various activities in the college. My sincere thanks go out to the principal, Professor Vrinda Bodkar, who ignites us in different activities in the college and for her perseverance towards the Diamond Jubilee celebration of DCT's Dempe College of Arts and Science. Sincere thanks to all the faculty and administrative staff who have contributed in shaping today's lecture. Thanks to all the participants attending this lecture through Google Meet and YouTube in large numbers and looking 
forward for such an overwhelming response in the future for the upcoming third lecture proposed on 9 november uh, sorry 19 november 2021 by uh, professor shekhar mande director general of csi government of india at 4 pm on google meet thank you once again sir uh, thank you chairman sir and thank you all of you for being with us thank you all thank, thank you, you so madam much. our program has ended thank you so thanks. much for joining us thank you folks have a bye great bye. evening you too bye bye thanks thank you bye